So I'm going to try. I'm going to try to record again. All right, let's jump into things, folks. Um, hopefully, this will this will all work. So uh, we. I was doing a little background about our thing, and and Monique, let me turn this section over to you. Maybe, could you give us a little uh, around our X comp and plenary? Um, I, I gave. Uh, I told most folks that we are a group of industry practitioners, journalists, ac academics, um, advocates, um, and what we do, uh, maybe a little background, and I know, and, and Monique is also leading um, the work around a technical standard um, around XR, so maybe, um, and actually Monique and I met uh, working, uh, creating, writing, co-authoring the, uh, the chapter on extended reality for the IEEE's flagship ethics publication, um, Ethically Aligned Design. So um, let me, wanna, just a quick little um, intro to the, the work that we've done or uh, sure. you're doing now. Yes, there's, um, there, as Mathana, they have uh, stated there, we have a history um, going back to at least 2016, 2017 together in this space of um, ethics um, in extended reality. And uh, we both, uh, we are all uh, co-chairs of this uh, particular group. There is a, uh, which, which as Mathana has indicated, it's very interdisciplinary group. And we are looking at all aspects of what ethics in an extended reality uh, could look like from education and medicine and, and, and so on. So it's a, it's an interesting uh, group of individuals. I am chairing also a standards group here, um, which is um, an IEEE lingua franca uh, called P7030, which is really setting the framework of what ethics and an extended reality standard could be. And it's looking at nomenclature. It's looking at also, can we agree on nomenclature? Can we agree, for example, on the, um, definition of ethics per se, which I think Mathana that would kind of clue you into or cue you, or cue you into uh, the next uh, part of our, our discussion. Great, thank you. So uh, just a little primer on, you know, what, what do we mean by ethics? I think this is a, a question we hear a lot about AI ethics. Ethics has really become this kind of buzzword. Um, and so I just wanted to start this session a little by, by talking about, you know, and framing both um, kind of how we have approached um, ethics and, and ethically aligned design um, and then kind of tie it in and how, you know, kind of uh, relates to, um, to the, the topic at hand and to accessibility, uh, but also inclusive design um, and active inclusion and in each component part and subsequent part of both the design development and deployment of XR technologies, but also on, on the user facing side as well. Um, so, you know, there is, uh, it, because XR has, you know, is, is quite a unique technology in the, in the immersive capacity, we get, you know, the senses of physical identity and time and agency are all, you know, a bit different than let's say our web 2.0 or, you know, like kind of the flat, you know, the flat screen, if you will, you know, the, the having a, you know, uh, being able to have directionality um, being able to have, you know, a, a comprehensive Z axis to be able to, you know, see things is, it, you know, brings along new ethical challenges from a content side, um, but also, you know, dis a display side. And as we think more and more about how um, algorithms and sort of AI agents and other things are going to be introduced into virtual worlds when it's not just kind of P2P, it's not just, you know, person to person inside of virtual worlds, but we have, you know, kind of a mixing of individuals inside of open worlds uh, mixed with, you know, sort of algorithmic agents, we really kind of get into this, you know, uh, this sort of paradigm where it is going to be tricky to say, okay, what is right? What, what is wrong? What are the gatekeepers of, of ethics, um, you know, already right now with even social media platforms, these multi-billion dollar companies, um, it's still difficult to be able to, to um, you know, have content moderation at scale. And particularly, you know, even the, the, the challenges of, of terms of service and community guidelines, where we get to the point where, you know, even uh, who is, who's sort of policing, who is writing the rules, who is saying what can and can't be said. 
And as we know that sometimes marginalized users are sometimes, you know, the most vulnerable on, on technology platforms, we get to, you know, some of these very difficult questions of, you know, if we said one sentence aimed at, you know, let's say um, able-bodied white cis male versus, you know, a, you know, a, a disabled, you know, black trans woman, you know, is, you know, is the, is the vernacular and the words themselves, you know, the really, you know, what are the ethics of even our language and how do we even kind of build in the, you know, thought processes around protecting marginalized users. Um, and it becomes tricky. And I think we all know, we've kind of seen, you know, this, some of this discourse play out on, on Twitter and other platforms. Um, but because platforms like ex extended reality, um, there's more even like kind of ephemeral communication, um, you know, that goes on. I think it's going to be more and more, you know, the, 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 some of these issues are more and more pressing. And so integrating ethics into XR systems is not going to be a replacement for, you know, prudent, um, you know, content moderation and platform governance on, on one hand, but at the same time, it's going to be necessary to, in some way, be able to create um, scalable systems, particularly when there's new notions of things like the quote unquote metaverse, you know, the sort of um, worlds inside of, uh, you know, a, a, a larger world. And I think this brings us to these questions of, well, you know, if I'm in the quote unquote metaverse one day, if there's going to be different sort of, you know, hosts in this sort of part, you know, in the, you know, fiefdom of the metaverse that I'm in, traversing, you know, these virtual spaces, am I as a user going to need to know all the sort of ethical red lines as well as the terms of service and community guidelines for each sort of kind of subcomponent and fiefdom of the metaverse that I, that I um, you know, go into um, and, and traverse. And I think this is one of these big questions we're already seeing. There's a lot of articles about, you know, Accenture and other large companies, as well as banks and other people are already kind of quote unquote buying property inside of the metaverse. And so I think that as there's already this kind of massive amounts of investment going in, but it's really an important time that we start thinking about, um, you know, kind of the, the, both the ethics of um, the landscape of, of ethics, but also the ethics of landscapes, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, just to think about um, ethics of and emerging technologies. So, and you'll see this, um, um, and if hopefully, I was sorry, I wasn't able to share this link. I was not able to access the chat, um, but um, in the, there is a section in, in the, um, in, in our shared doc here, and this is actually some, some stuff that I, I've been thinking about for a while and I kind of put in a few, I just kind of wrote up uh, a few, three different perspectives on ethics. And I, just to, just a frame now for our, for our um, deep dive here. And I just wanna, this is just kind of for, for food for thoughts about three different ways that we could perceive even the notion of ethics, right? And so ethics as socio-technological code, so ethics as code, ethics as a human, choice, so human ethic, ethics as a choice, and ethics as societal value, so ethics as a value. So ethics as a code, ethics as a choice, and ethics as a value. And I want to share some thoughts on this because I think it is, you know, pragmatic and prudent that we kind of at the front, at the, you know, beginning say that actually even, uh, and myself as being a, a tech ethicist, um, and, and and philosopher, I, I think a lot about, and I've been working on the textual standards space around AI ethics for, oh, I guess, yeah, over five years now. And I've worked with organizations like the Electronic Frontier Foundation um, um, on, on content moderation policies and other things. And so this has been very close to my heart. And what I have seen in, in this space is as many people approach even the very, the very notion or term of ethics uh, to mean different things. We're now seeing a lot of, you know, we hear more and more about ethics washing. Um, and so I think it's important that we, you know, kind of up, up top say, what are some of the ways that different people approach ethics, even if they have the best intentions at heart? And so 
so uh, you know ethics as a socio-technological code and you know some some see ethics as some sort of human plus machine code that underpins system operations. Um, the rationale is if we can create a quote unquote ethical system, such systems will provide baseline or fundamental protections for users. And we can actually use ethics as a code that interfaces between humans and machines. And then with the output of actually being, you know, uh, both protections um, but hopefully also, you know, uh, in, in things like inclusive design and, and accessibility. Uh, we have ethics as a, you know, a human choice. And some people see, you know, systems that give people the opportunity to choose thresholds of their own system interaction that adhere to their own personal virtues or values as kind of this choice, this human choice as being ethics. And so, you know, for instance, if society sees accessibility as a, um, or an individual sees, you know, accessibility as a choice-based choice -based ethical principle, then things like content displays um, would, you know, or it would follow that if, uh, that, you know, things like content displays would be created, you know, adapted in a, in a way that would accommodate um, people who are, 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 are vision impaired. So this idea, if we can create ethical systems, that it provides a human choice, um, and not just a human choice on a larger scale, but hopefully uh, to each individual that enters into the system has enough choice that suits them. Then we have, you know, ethics as a societal value. And I think this is really where it gets, uh, there, this is an interesting, you know, angle, because, you know, ethics can also be seen as an extension, um, you know, of, of sociocultural values into digital designs, particularly amongst, emerge, you know, when it comes to emerging technologies where there is some path dependency, but it's, per, it's perhaps, you know, there still is a lot of, you know, novel design space for, for, um, for things that have not yet, you know, that, that are still sort of the, the, the realm of, you know, of, of fiction more than science, if you will. Um, and so, if we, if we see, you know, ethics as a, as a, as a value, even a personal, but even a societal value, then it would probably file, follow that, you know, the design, development, and deployment of cyber physical systems like XR. We can think about, you know, the portals and ecosystems, the platforms that host content, the headsets, you know, it's all these sort of things that bring this um, level of immersive computing that, um, that you know, as an, as an extension of, of values, um, we could actually almost maybe be a little reflective and say, okay, and maybe this is almost more of a content analysis sort of perspective, but looking at a system, um, you know, we can look at just for an instance, Meta, um, Facebook, um, and the Horizon Worlds and these sort of things. And just as an example here, and I, I don't normally like to you know, pick on companies um, in, in where, well, wearing with this hat, but I think it is also important to, to use some tangible examples to say, okay, well, if there, what, how, what can we learn about these systems? You know, who were they built for? And we, there, we have heard reports of, you know, harassment and gender-based harassment inside of, of um, some of, you know, Horizon Worlds, uh, Meta's um, XR properties. And so, you know, looking at it, what can we discern as far as the eth design ethics from the ability for individuals to capitalize on the lack of robust protections inside of XR worlds? And I think, and I think that this is an interesting way to look at things and, and, and hopefully, you know, in the future more, you know, if there is, you know, research pops up around this sort of um, around this sort of, you know, viewpoint, we might be able to, you know, uh, what, in a few years, you know, whole dissertations, if not, you know, whole departments uh, of universities might be able to look in and say, okay, what, what is a sort of a, uh, how, how do we analyze the ethics of various platforms and portals and hardware even by what we can ascertain around the you know, design both ethos and and functionality and so i think that these three things um i just wanted to start with these the idea because really you know the this, the name of this talk, um, session is integrating ethics into xr systems but i just wanted to, to, to flag that you know that there's actually uh different ways that we can approach the very notion of 
of quote unquote ethics and that it, it, we need, must be careful in situations in when we're talking about ethics to actually be able to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and so actually, that being said, I think that some of the stuff that we'll be talking about today will actually kind of be a, uh, in some cases, in some of these, uh, in, in some of the examples, will be able to give different or come from different perspectives. But I just wanted to set up at the top this, I, this notion of, the, of code, of choice, and value of, you know, some people might actually say, you know, at this kind of this middle of this three-point Venn diagram is maybe where their quote-unquote ethics lie. But um, because there's so much scholarship and, and literature coming out on this, and so it's a, a topic that I'm very immersed in, I wanted to, you know, kind of draw out my own, you know, observations from what we actually mean by quote-unquote ethics. Oh, uh, and I'm just going to say, so three other concerns, and I would like to just open it up in one moment to see if there's anybody has any questions or comments on this. Um, before we kind of start, start dealing into some of the, you know, into, into more um, uh, um, tangible content around actually how do we, uh, what are some of the more tangible ways that we can integrate ethics into XR systems, um, as well as looking at um, actually from a kind of a human centric perspective. So um, one of the things I want people to think about, or it'd be nice for people to think about during this session is, um, you know, and some of the concerns for accessibility, um, Three, three things. One, you know, how do we avoid ableist design? Um, and this is particularly, you know, applicable, I think, or, you know, important when it comes to invisible disabilities. Um, and, and also, you know, and, and a part of this perhaps is, is sensory awareness as well. And so um, I want people to, you know, uh, yeah, this is something that I hopefully people can, can come away from this session of thinking a little, uh, you know, more about um, and come back to their communities to think about what are the ways that we can use ethics to avoid ableist design, but also how can we ensure that uh, the developers and designers of systems are, um, are also thinking about uh, things like invisible disabilities. Um, and part of this, but a, you know, an, an expert is, is active inclusion. How, how do we create, you know, how do we, how are we, how do we actively uh, include individuals? And I will, we have time. Hopefully, talk about this a little more. Um, this is a big focus of my work, um, and also then thinking about a third part is harassment, privacy, and consensual encounters. And I, I can I think that these all three of these things, you know, are are important because harassment has its own, um, you know, it, it, its own. There's a, there's a, harassers, let's say, <laughs> come in different shapes and sizes. Um, privacy as another part, how do I, even if I am harassed, you know, how can I make sure that I'm not compromised personally, but also how, you know, consensual encounters. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the, the main XR worlds now um, had to create these quote unquote bubbles around because there was, you know, simulated sexual violence in, in, um, in the, in, you know, in this, this VR world. And, um, just having said that, I, I, I just want to say I, this, this session is going to be, um, I, there, there might be a, 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 some talk of um, simulated sexual violence. I, I'll just put a mild content warning here and now, but I don't think that there were, I, I do not have currently plans um, for at least my, you know, pre-drafted um, portion to, to get into too deep into that and so I but I just wanted to, to say up front um, that there might be some mild discussion of of, of gender-based violence uh, or, or um, non-consensual encounters in XR so just to put a, a content warning up at the, at the top. Um, right and then I think one other thing to start thinking about is you know accessible information design this is something uh, also that we'll um, touch on. So um, before before going to like this next session, just wanted to, to um, yeah, take a, a couple of moments here to open up, see if anybody had any um, comments before we kind of uh, dive in and we'll actually kind of, I'll be giving a summary of the reports um, that uh, Dylan's still here. Dylan was a co-author of, and uh, that we had published uh, the um, Extended Reality Ethics of Diversity, Inclusion and Accessibility. Um, but before we dive into that section, I just wanted to open the floor up to see if anybody had any um, quick comments. This is Monique. Um, 
I, you all have really uh, framed up uh, the corpus of our work. Um, and of course, uh, the uh, expertise that, um, that uh, you all Mathano have been bringing to, to the table in this particular discussion. Uh, in fact, uh, for our colleagues here, this is exactly the type of content we are, we are discussing. Um, and imagine, if you will, that uh, in, within the, uh, the organization, this international organization called IEEE, this is where we're trying to set actually a standard around uh, this particular space. And so uh, it's created a, quite a bit of uh, interesting discussions. Uh, and, and of course, uh, particularly as you all have done, uh, Mathana's defining what ethics is, it's contextual um, at, the end of, at the end of the day. So, and uh, you know, when you were looking at uh, which ethics and what, and what, that, what does that look like? It's a very, very major discussion. And of course, um, one of the things uh, that I will think, one of the main themes that one will see throughout uh, the discussion today, or uh, when you have a chance to look at the reference, arc, uh, reference work, is this whole issue around privacy or privacy. Um, it's uh, kind of a running theme uh, here. And so I think it's kind of interesting to see um, what that means, especially when we're looking in these multimodal uh you know, realities. So, uh, yeah, wonderful frame up. Thank you all. Thank you, Monique. And yeah, as saying that uh, Monique and I are, are co chairs of the uh, IEEE's Global Initiative for the Ethics of, of Extended Reality, uh, also both co founders. Uh, we have a great team. Um, and, yep, so I, I think in the, we will post, I hope people are able to, to look um the doc the document um and then also maybe i uh, think the slack channel will um put put some links as well and uh the document's not there uh, we'll put in direct links to the the various publications as, as well um after the after. so um let's So integrating, so uh, again, the the, the um, title of this breakout session, we're honored to have you, you all with us, is is integrating ethics into XR systems. And so I think it'd be great to, to start out actually with um, with some highlights and actually do quite, uh, do a, a deep dive into um, the particularly starting with a chapter as I mentioned that, that Dylan Fox had had co-authored um, and Dylan Fox has, has been part of our initiative um, since the beginning and has, has contributed um, a, a lot to our work. Um, so we're, we're very honored to have been invited here and also be able to um, be able to sort of, yeah, create sort of a community of, of individuals that are looking, you know, to make um, ethical and, and inclusive technology. Um, and so I'm going to read some of this verbatim, um, but we'll try to, you know, get to the uh, really try to, to get to the point because we have um, they, they have some co cohesive and um, really kind of yeah some some recommendations around uh, around the way to have um, the most inclusive and, and, eth and ethical technology as we're thinking about designing um, you know, XR experiences but also also hardware. So we, I think we, since we're here, you know, at this at the symposium, I think, it's, I think it's clear to probably most of us that that, that people with disabilities have, have long faced discrimination, um, and particularly with their access to information technology. You know, it's maybe not they've been perhaps you know the technology has as you know excluded people with disabilities from actually let's just say. People are not on, you know, on social, not able to sign up to social media because of a disability. But we all know that information design is primarily built around, you know, fully able-bodied individuals, and because of those, because of the the able-bodiedness and sort of the the kind of um, 
yeah, the yeah, the enable wantiness of, of of system designers, we really sort of see this perpetuating. Um, and I think we, we kind of see this in some other ways, right? Um, we we and it's more pronounced in um, extended reality, but we also see this in um, you know, even like the sort of um, gender-based de design of, of things like phone mobile handsets. And, you know, I, I think I heard a, a lot of people say, particularly, you know, female bodied individuals um, saying like, why are these phones getting so big? Like they, it's not just like, don't fit in. I don't have a, I need to carry a new, another bag to carry my device, but even I can't even text with one hand, right? And so I think that we're all seeing, we're seeing this sort of, um, from Silicon Valley in particular, this sort of, you know, where the, the phone is almost becoming a tablet at this point. And it does change even in this, this sense of maybe the, the individuals who are doing the product testing on this might be able to, you know, hold with one hand and text with a thumb. But for many of the standard you, you know, users of this product, it's gonna now be a two hand device. And so I think we're already kind of seeing this in kind of, you know, existing um, technology on the market, um, but as, now, you know, we're now seeing with, with XR and immersive technologies, both with kind of AR um, you know, glasses, um, goggles, but also fully immersive um, XR technology that, um, that, that there are going to, that it's not just the hardware itself, but it we're all, that there's also kind of the portal and, and, and environmental aspects um, that are that are going to need to be rethought of, and but now is a really good time, I think, for us to be having these conversations because hopefully there's still time to to get ahead of some of these um, design design decisions before they're you know kind of hard coded as hardware in in you know um, in in this emerging technology. Um, so I think there are some interesting questions. You know how. Um, even when it comes to directionality of, of, of audio, um, what do captions look like when we are, um, you know, if, if there's going to be, um, if, if someone is perhaps um, has a, a low visibility or the far-sighted, near-sighted, there, there's visible, visible, visual impairment. There are also these big questions about, well, because anyone, because because you know, disability and, and impairment is not just a standard thing. It is it is unique to the person. That actually having, you know, the system designers are going to need to think about the dynamic variableness of individual disability, uh, and this you know if a system a system designer is checking the box to say oh well we have you know we, we have a we have captions now you know that uh, that that do render um in in our content displays well you know that we may find that actually some people this is actually it is not set at the right place it's it's you know there's obfuscation um you know backgrounds are obfuscated because or you know occluded from from this design um, is going to be disorienting, you know, that actually the text that appears is not going to be legible. Um, or, you know, even the sort of the, the things that maybe that this text box overlay for, you know, for accessibility um, does display well in um, Latin characters, but in Arabic or, you know, Chinese or even you know uh, Cyrillic that it, it it becomes um, un unreadable, right? And so I think that it's also thinking about how about who who is our user, you know, what, how do we expand our potential user base um, to think about accessibility uh, tools inside of XR design um, beyond. You know, how can we continuously start thinking about the more and more and more inclusiveness and and language support is is going to be one of those very important things. Um, Microsoft Word is notorious for disconnecting um, the the you know Arabic script, and 
you so you have all these kind of funny signs that are kind of almost romanized in the sense of like latinized like in the sense of these character base when actually you know arabic is, is written as as kind of a cursive continuous script um and so these are the kind of things that sometimes the designers are not thinking about but again if we're thinking about um you know this the ethics as code and value and and things that how can we ensure that you that we are designing for um accessibility not just in any one group um but we're actually having scalable and sustainable um accessibility uh, as an as a as a design ethic so um i'm gonna now dive into um some actually yeah so some bullet points to to, to uh, that are going that are the recommendations that we have that have come out of the paper that we published on this topic um and so we, we talked about um the way that, like altering size of objects elements and text um we say that there are several ways uh developers can allow users to control the visual elements um in an app um or an experience that would aid low vision users in compel uh, completing tasks and or enhancing their experience and so six uh um suggestions here uh magnify or reduce objects and text to make them larger or smaller and again now these are allowing users so i think this is a very important part i just want to reiterate that actually being able to give user control is hopefully going to be able to get us out of this sort of box um mentality that i described earlier which is oh we just check a box because uh there's you know magnified or not yeah but actually being able to give users control here i think is a really important element so i just wanted to reiterate that um changing fonts for more easily uh readable text um and i think again this is what i mentioned earlier when it comes to um non um, latin scripts i think it's going to be um, you know uh really really important um add a contrast or edge enhancements to highlight objects and text. Change, the next one, uh, it's on number four, change foreground and background colors of text. Uh, five, change the brightness levels in the app. And I think this could be a, a way of actually maybe change the brightness levels, but perhaps even giving control over, you know, dialogue boxes and these sort of things that maybe do not um, actually scale with the, uh, with the brightness of the world. Um, uh, around, um, or be able to change, you know, brightness levels of just things like text boxes, um, and employ uh, peripheral maps to show objects outside the field of vision. Yeah. So uh, we've also so the next section that we talked about is um, audio augmentation and text to speech, and I think this is a very important one, uh, a very important, um, or is going to be more and more important not just and this is where we kind of we cross into these sort of things if this is going to be a technology that's going to be with humanity for a while then eventually it's not just going to be uh perhaps users that are um you know that are visually impaired or or um in, in this sense you know visually impaired but also or um or the, that are visually impaired but also as people get you know, as, as people get older it's the natural Regression of of sensory of, of of sensoriness is going to you know it's important that we start thinking about these things now, um, and so we we talked about the chapter talks about um, audio augmentation as an important feature um, that should be available to users with with vision loss. Um, so we have text to speech uh, TTS as the acronym, um, also known as read aloud, um, read aloud. Um, so. And it may work well to ensure that users uh, who otherwise can't read text instructions, labels, or other written elements inside of an app are able to understand and interact with an app effectively. So really thinking about these ways, how can users have, you know, how can we think about, you know, uh, inclusive design um, as an ethical design principle that ultimately just allow everyone to use, you know, the app as quote as quote, quote unquote, you know, designed to be used. Um, and because there's so much diversity of the, you know, uh, of, of humans that so we, we think about it, so many of the products, services and tools that surround us aren't 
actually able to be used effectively by many people. So this TTS text to speech is already a built in feature um, in a lot of operating systems for computers, smartphones, um, and developers, you know, ha have this sort of kind of back in library to consult existing software solutions, see what kind of can be built on over the top uh, when designing their XR TTS. Um, or, the, you know, and also they, it gives them the chance also to build um, platform to natively support an existing um, uh, text to speech uh, system. And, um, you know, developers should also include optical character recognition as a feature um, so that words included in images that may be used in XR apps can be deciphered by low vision users. Um, and I, I think that I don't know if I guess I assume that some of, of y'all are on 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 Twitter. Um, and so I think that we're now seeing like alt text, right? And I think that there are more kind of interesting ways that platforms are also allowing users at the point of upload to be able to augment their um, content um, in, in a way that allows other users to be able to um, to to interact with it. And so I would also probably add, add that as a um, as, as another sort of, uh, of a way to, to think about what, what are the ways that, that, user, that, that platforms enable users also to label and tag their own you know, user-generated content that is gonna be able not put the onus on the platform to auto tag or augment, um, but then allows uh, yeah, users to, um, to, to share their, their content with the most amount of audiences. Um, so for, for deaf and hard of hearing folks, um, we've made some recommendations of captioning audio features, uh, captioning audio features, using icons to identify audio features. Um, and this we say, um, using icons or other indicators to identify for users how they should move their heads or reorient focus to ensure that they are able to see in the direction from which the verbal or nonverbal audio features are emanating. So if we're able to have, you know, little indicators for, especially in these, you know, 360 degree immersive environments um, that having um, indicators uh, will in, make sure that individuals don't lose out on a whole layer of information design just because um, they weren't able to hear inside of this 3D sound design. <clears throat> um, sign language as well. Um, Developers may want to consider augmenting their captions with an option to persistently display sign language interpretation within the app. Um, and just within, just as with captioning, developers should allow users to control placement of the sign language visual to ensure the visual information is not obscured. Now, yeah. um, and so this session is going by really quickly, but I think that these are, and hopefully these are, are, are useful for folks. Um, and so I'm going to try to go through um, here the next we still have a few things. I'm just going to bullet point these um, and hopefully be able to have the last um, last uh, couple of minutes for for quick discussion. So um, mobile disabilities, uh, we talk about settings and menu options I talked about earlier, allowing users to choose um, to have the app assist them in navigating an in interface, um, allowing users to receive assistance um, by having a separate uh, controller or sensor, um, allowing users to access e experience from a seated reclining or stationary position, um, especially if it's if it's uh, otherwise require standing or, or body movements to access full content. Um, the dynamic um, rendering eye tracking, uh, we talk about, you know, just things for developers, interface navigation, input selection, um, automatic scrolling, aim assistance, object selection, text and fine detail rendering quality, and analytics and user research. Um, controller hand-free tracking, um, talking about you know, the, uh, being able to allow users to have both absolute and relative interactions with the app to ensure that the user can both directly touch a nearby object, absolute, call it, um, or control or manipulate objects farther away, relative. Um, and finally, we you know, did uh, include a section around cognitive disabilities as well. Um, so our suggestions here are providing on-demand functions to allow user uh, to receive assistance 
and orientating, orientating themselves um, and providing in-app prompts uh, to remind, to, for reminders for things like help topics um, or introductions to new features, um, providing trading opportunities for users to experiment with interface and control for configurations. Um, so especially if they can, you know, choose the, 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 the uh, um, UX UI that, that suits them best. Um, and if we, um, and allowing users to hide dis, uh, distracting or non-critical interface components. Um, and finally, if the design requires users to uh, use separate controllers to accomplish tasks, um, allowing users to con con create control reviews for the interface to help them navigate the controllers more accurately. Uh -huh. So since I think we just have about 15 minutes left in this, uh, we have a lot more content um, and I was hoping to get to kind of the harassment and trolling because I think that that's also for marginalized or you know at risk um, communities. But um, I did want to, yeah, yeah, to, um, open the floor up now for, for um, feedback now that we've kind of gone through that section. I hope that, I know it was kind of reading off the page, but um, we have put a lot of work into this. Um, and I said Dylan Fox is a co-author of this, and I thought it would, it would be pragmatic to actually, hopefully, uh, let some folks know that we we do have some concrete and practical and implementable, you know, su suggestions and recommendations. So, on that note, does somebody have any uh, comments, thoughts, feedback? Again, this is Monique. Um, a f a fantastic um, uh, summary of of what is a. a a wonderful corpus of work, and particularly from Dylan Fox, who uh, who has really um, contributed to that particular chapter. And for, for our colleagues here, um, what's important to note is that we are, um, you know, we are stimulating a discuss stimulating discussion uh, in the industry uh, to think about some of the uh, headlines that, that we, or, or rather, the chapters that we have actually as a uh, community. Have, uh, have published together. Uh, and they are in, in various areas uh, like medicine, education, like trolling, pr privacy, and so on. And so it's really important to note that um, whilst this was a very, very, very short <laughs> snippet of time that we have, what's really key is that, um, that you all will have an opportunity to uh, review uh, the work that has been published to date. Back to you all, Methana. Cheers, or should I, should I just just uh, summarize uh, medicine very quickly? I know we have fifteen minutes. We've just received the fifteen minute warning before I hand over to you oh, cool. to, to yeah, trolling. Because I think yeah, sure. to, you know, tee this up to say, um, as, as you know, one of the things we have working on is this. You know, what I've given before is thinking more on the from a human centric perspective, user centric perspective. But more and more things like digital twins and these other sort of things are being built to have uh, professionals like medical professionals be able to both for the tooling and training, but also for, you know, um, diagnostics and these sort of things. And so we have with the medical uh, medicine, we're, we're now also want to make sure that um, thing, you know, things like bias um, and, you know, the ethic, you know, risk mitigation and harm reduction as an ethic as well. And so, yeah, Moni, if you want to just, uh, yeah, quick sure. on that. Um, and so just to give people an idea of, of what else we're doing and yeah, except making sure that accessibility um, is a kind of a full stack approach um, and that also these technologies don't unduly disenfranchise, not just disenfranchise any individuals that might come across it. Absolutely. I mean, um, so with regard to extended reality and ethics in medicine, it's uh, very much emerging uh, space and um, there's, uh, you know, we have to look at what that uh, in entire ecosystem is, includes uh, neuroscience and pharmacy and telehealth, as well as surgery. So one of the key issues that, uh, um, that people are looking at, uh, practitioners are looking at is uh, XR related health concerns, but specific to cyber sickness. Um, which have been reported by uh, patients who have been using XR applications. And the other areas which I stated before of concern is patient privacy and how, what is its ethical use, um, you know, that has to be addressed. One of the areas that uh, we have to think about is 
how is what is the potential for misuse or abuse of uh, personal data? Uh, what does it mean? Because this is a space medicine, medicine is regulated when you have an unregulated ex, um, extended reality that has um, you know, an association to, to medicine itself or to, its, uh, to a practice. Uh, so it, that may come out with uh, unfavorable um, outcomes. So we have to actually look at that very closely. And about, you know, again, this is about building, embedding ethics and systems, but about XR, how it, you know, what does it mean in terms of embedding it in companies' decisions and their processes and products? So uh, the uh, implication here is that algorithms can change over, uh, adapt over time. So one of the areas that, uh, two areas that we think that are, could be interesting for uh, research here is, you know, look at the development of medical XR ethics framework, um, which is needed, uh, you know, as the, the two worlds are coming together, looking at it uh, from an exploration from ex uh, ethical lens of rights and responsibilities and, and reputation. And secondly, the development of, um, again, it's a summary of medical XR ethics decision-making as a model, you know, with a model itself, which would provide a decision-making roadmap for collaborators and this ecosystem, st uh, stakeholders and other decision-makers to um, uh, in include context and facts about the design of the de uh, technology itself. And I wanted to give you at least a few more minutes, you all, uh, Mathana, back, uh, back to you on, on trolling. If you wanted to discuss that or summarize. All right. Yeah, and before I do, I'll just open, um, yeah, the floor up. Uh, I think we have about 10 minutes. And just if yeah, anybody has any comments, uh, please feel free to, uh, or any questions. Um, Yeah, you can feel free to, to ask now. And um, I think in the Slack, I think what we'll post in the Slack, uh, we have a, uh, a an email address that can, we can be contacted by, um, as well as we have on our webpage, as I mentioned, uh, which is um, we'll post as well. Uh, people people can sign up. We have a hour long call the last Thursday of every month, mm -hmm. um, and we can get you on that uh, recurring calendar invite. Um, and so we're always looking, you know, with this sort of community here, um, it, um, XR Access and you know, and people have, um, have put together is, is absolutely, you know, the, you know, the people that are, that are, that are at this event are, you know, there's almost a, a circle, the Venn diagram of the people that we hope will also, you know, we can we can, can engage more of and continue to collaborate on on the the, the efforts that we are working on um, the kind of bridge you know kind of the advocacy space but also into industry uh, policy making and um, uh, journalism and academia. So, um, so say so, you know, when it when it comes to things like uh, harassment and trolling. It's interesting because another chapter we have is also um, looking at the idea of like a, a, a right to our own identity. And I think there's a very interesting sort of um, uh, over, overlay here or, or you know, overlap because we have sort of the modalities of self in, in XR environments. And really depending on, like, on how, um, you know, how we present ourselves, there may be different kind of threat models of how how systems and and those um, and other users uh, might be adversarial to our our um, presence in these systems. Um, so we are you know, presumably an original individual sitting there inside of an XR, you know, and then putting on um, uh, hardware and interesting with, with software um, that will enable us to you know to come. Be, become into a virtually mediated uh, environment. And so we can talk about you know, things like avatars, right? And this is, I was going to describe like the virtual representation and, and mediation of an original individual controlled by the same individual, but is perhaps not, is not a quote unquote, like kind of carbon copy that where that it's not um, a 
uh, a virtual representation, an avatar also could be, you know, might not look anything like us. Um, but then we also talk about the idea of like a virtual clone. And this is a bit, um, and this actually, as, as described by us, actually has a visual likeness to a person um, or to the original individual. Um, there's visual fidelity. Um, and in this sense, it also becomes the, the, the uh, physical or the visual fidelity of the physical appearance becomes a continuum. Um, and so there are different ways that we can sort of think about um, how even what, it, what is the likeness or our representation inside of, of these uh, virtual worlds. Um, and so we could think about, you know, for, um, for, I don't know, for, for XR in the classroom, right? Like it might actually be interesting, you know, if, if people are, I don't know, if, if in school settings, there is something like bullying going on, um, what is then, um, is there, is it possible to, you know, give young people if they are going to be inside of, 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 of virtual spaces, um, how can we then perhaps you know, make, uh, give them more flexibility and, and agency over their own likeness. Um, Cause we do have, you know, different types of harassment, you know, they're trolling. Um, there's also griefing to talk about, which is the, we describe as the act of deliberately irritating or harassing other players by using aspects of the game in unintended ways, right? So this could be like destroying something another player made um, or built. Um, yeah, or using, you know, features that actually might not have been, you know, conceptualized by the designers as a way that creates, you know, kind of a, a harassment. Um, we also, you know, a very, a very real thing, particularly if there's going to be kind of this virtual clone, um, you know, identity-based targeted harassment, um, which, you know, I think we've seen at least in, you know, the pre-XR spaces as often manifesting as, racism or xenophobia or, you know, vocal misogyny or these sort of things. <clears throat> um, and then, you know, the, and th this could also be, you know, using, um, using language, right? There was um, uh, Red Dead 2, this open world game had a problem um, where if uh, players were, that their avatars or virtual clones were um, persons of color, particularly black users that there was these kind of roaming games of other users that were going around and um engaging in yeah basically race-based violence inside of an open world game right <laughs> it's kind of wild but this is like wow this is happening and so i think it's it and there's also of course we know gender-based violence and sexual harassment um, which is particularly problematic in XR worlds. Um, the physical representation of, of, of sexual violence is, is, you know, it can be trauma inducing um, or, you know, it can, you know, it, it can really build on, on, on past trauma as well. And so um, protecting users with inside of emerging worlds is going to, you know, is going to be really important. And one thing to think about um, is also algorithmic auditing, right? And, and this is something I wanted to highlight because Microsoft chatbot Tay, which y'all may have remembered, which in like 24 hours went, became, you know, racist, xenophobic and misogynistic uh, because of user input, because of the way it was modeled, the learning model um, uh, was just resuscitating, you know, kind of the high frequency sort of, um, you know, for, you know, uh, targeted harassment and just kind of building this in this model. Um, also GPT-3 um, also was found to uh, certain prompts have, you know, kind of um, racist and xenophobic language. Uh, and so I think it's gonna be important um, that, you know, this is kind of the uh, way for applied ethics research is to also think about kind of on the tech, uh, the technical side, how can developers start also building in enough protection into even the algorithmic agents, AI agents, um, chatbots or whatever it, they might be that have this sort of dynamic, uh, the dynamicness of, of input to output um, to make sure that users can't sort of, uh, the particular users that want to just troll or other things aren't able, and even especially early adopters are not, able 
to kind of almost DDoS um, algorithmic systems with hateful content that then leads to algorithms, algorithmic agents inside of gameplay or in-app experiences um, disenfranchise users because of this early and targeted um, a, a hate filledness um, of what we're gonna call it that is kind of almost like content um, jamming, if you will, I guess another way to say this um, at the beginning. So we got about one minute left, but I just wanted to highlight that that you know it's it's one thing about you know user controls, having strong content moderation policies, having multiple strikes, um, being able to have the users have arbitration um, to say I was a fin you know I was there was there was targeted harassment. So all of these things are going to be important, but for this crowd, I will it's, a, it's the longer term thing. Um, but thinking about things like um, um, algorithmic um, jamming and stuff. So. I'm not sure if we're going to be pulled back to the room in one minute now, but um, I just want to thank everybody for um, thank you all for for being here on this session. And um, yeah, I think in the Slack or you know on the website you'll be able to find us. And we would we would uh, it would be great if 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 folks could um, could yeah if y'all are interested to to join our monthly meetings. Uh, let me just get the date. I don't have my calendar open, but the last Thursday of this month um, we will be talking in so you're all invited and thank you uh, yeah thank you for being here thank you thank you all Mathana and and I did put in this uh, slack Mathana the you know where where uh, folks can find us um how they can contact us uh in our in our uh, session uh again uh it's a summary of a lot of work and a lot of uh, modalities that we're discussing including education and, and business and and the and the economy overall so uh, we do invite you all to to participate we you know we've um we're, we're very great grateful to dylan for uh setting this in, entire conference up because it is an extremely important area and extremely important when we're talking about um you know in, integrating xr into into systems overall so thank you I thought that was an excellent uh, overview, Mathana. We enjoyed that. And please feel free, to everyone, to read um, our work. I, I was a bit verbatim, but some, sometimes these reports can get a little, uh, maybe might get a little heavy. I think they are really nice foundational documents, and but I, I've felt that, you know, kind of just giving the abridged summary. Um, and so hopefully people are able to, to think a little, yeah. Um, more about so you know contextualize both from the design developer side but also from the the end user side um but also to know that there are some um yeah that there are that there are um that we have published some uh publications that actually deal with this so people now have I, now that they know there's a resource um that is available free to download of course um all available um on our, on our web page thanks again all right, looks like about 30 seconds from now, but thank you all again for being here. And we'll see you all in the breakout room.